So welcome to Diabetes the Sweet Truth. So excited for y'all to be with us today and we're going to just go ahead and get started. My name is Abby Horton. I am an assistant professor in the Capstone College of Nursing here at the university. I am a certified health and life coach, a WellBama ambassador for the Honors College where I teach part-time and your wellness class educator. My contact information is Abby period Horton at ua.edu. And if I can ever be of help or assistance to you, please feel free to reach out to me. If you have any questions or feedback from today, please feel free to let me know in the chat, but you're also welcome to email as well. So the impact of diabetes, I know that when you're coming to a class like this, if you're just wanting to get some strategies to help with you know, your diet or your meal plan or managing your blood sugar, this may not be as uh, you know, important to you, but I think it's important just for the overall education because sometimes it's important for us to remember that we're not alone. And many people are struggling with um, their blood sugar and making sure that their blood sugar levels or insulin levels are staying uh, in a normal range. And so in the U.S. alone, about one in three Americans is either diagnosed as diabetic, which is about 30 million patients, or pre-diabetic, which is about 87 million patients. Uh, and this costs about $242 billion in medical treatments uh, every year. And so that's important to have that perspective, because if you feel alone in your diagnosis, you are not. Uh, in 2015, 9.4% of the population was considered to have diabetes as a diagnosis. And so I've given you some other stats here. Certainly we know that, you know, over the age of 18, we have 84.1 million Americans who are considered to have prediabetes, meaning that they have elevated blood sugar levels that are staying sustained elevation um, throughout, you know, testing. And so um, we also know that diabetes is one of our main um, chronic illnesses that we're, we're struggling with today. And part of that is our American diet. You know, we sometimes call the American diet the standard American diet, sad. Uh, and some people will call it the modern American diet, which is mad. And so um, that's something to consider because diet really does play a huge role in um, the development of diabetes. But I will say there are other things as well. You know, there are things like your genetics, um, lifestyle behaviors, apart from nutrition, nutrition, which is not just about individual choices. You know, we only sometimes have choices from you know, what is the better of the two choices. Sometimes we don't have good choices to make. Uh, and so I just want you to know that when we're talking about diabetes, uh, you know, while there are some things that you can control and we should focus on the things that you can control, um, there are certainly components of this that aren't within our control. And I think diabetes is one of those diagnoses that I see a lot of shame and guilt around. Um, that people feel, you know, a little bit sometimes embarrassed to talk about their diagnosis. Um, and so I want to really, you know, commend you for being here today to learn more about diabetes, whether you have a diagnosis or whether you're just interested. Because again, um, you know, if you have a cancer diagnosis, if you have, you know, some other type of diagnosis, um, those diagnoses, a lot of times, um, you know, we get some sympathy or we get, you know, a meal brought to us or we get flowers or a, maybe a mailed card. Um, and when we have other things that um, feel like they're more in our control, like diabetes, we don't. But the reality is, is that even when we have cancer, there are a lot of lifestyle things that impact our cancer diagnosis too. And so um, I want y'all to see diabetes as something that, um, you know, it is something we're all kind of facing. We're all really needing to monitor our blood sugar, whether we have a diagnosis or not. And um, if you have any kind of guilt or shame around the diagnosis, to really, um, you know, feel comfortable today in knowing that you're doing your very best and that um, there are a lot of factors outside of our control. But we're going to focus on the things that we can control. So in Alabama, we have a lot of challenges. When I look at the CDC report for the things that we're facing in Alabama, these are the challenges that are listed. And so I highlighted the, the last one, the second to last year, diabetes has increased 19% between 2011 and 2019, which is our latest data. We do have a little bit of data from 2020, but 2019 is our last complete set of data on diabetes. 
And so we've gone from 11.8% of our population in Alabama to 14% of our adult population having diagnosis of diabetes. And so this is one of the things that we really want to focus on in our state. And this goes hand in hand with the fact that we also are leading in obesity. And so, again, I really want to emphasize that, you know, just because you have diabetes does not mean that you have an obesity diagnosis. It doesn't mean that you have a weight problem. Um, it means that you have an insulin resistance problem or an insulin problem if you're a type 1 diabetic. Um, we also want to talk about gestational diabetes. And so that's something that's really important. And um, just know that obesity and, and insulin resistance, um, that those are not always synonymous with each other. So in our country, when we look at the prevalence, of course, usually the Southeast um, geographically is going to be the most targeted in terms of the highest prevalence of diabetes. And like I mentioned, 14% of our adults do have a diagnosis of diabetes, but about 37% of our state, are, um, our citizens are pre-diabetic and they may not know. Most people who have pre-diabetes do not know. They have not been diagnosed uh, or they're not aware of their risk factor. So I think this is an important way to kind of contextualize the challenge that we have. So diabetes is just an increased sugar that's circulating in the blood known as hyperglycemia. And diabetes gets diagnosed when you have prolonged hyperglycemia. And that is measured by your blood glucose level. We've mentioned A1C a minute ago. And so um, blood glucose levels are obtained through a finger stick or vena puncture. So it's your at-home meter that you're testing, or maybe it's through blood work at the doctor's office. And it fluctuates based on what we eat and consume every day in our diet. You also can have H1, uh, A1C, which is the level that you can get, again, through a finger stick or a venipuncture. Um, and so what you're going to see is that over the 90 to 100 day period, you're going to look at how much sugar is in the blood over that time. And it is considered the gold standard for diagnosis. Now, your... Uh, range is going to vary depending on a number of factors. So someone asked, you know, what is a good A1C? And that's really going to depend on so many things, um, whether or not you're newly diagnosed, whether or not you have been well controlled in the past on, on your medications or insulin, depending on if you're insulin dependent. So there, there is not a gold standard in terms of, you know, we want everyone to be at this level because it's gonna really range and depend on your personal background. And um, most of the time you're gonna see folks wanting you to be um, at five or lower. If you have diabetes, you actually uh, can have a little bit higher A1C. So your normal range is going to be a little bit higher than someone who is not diabetic, um, but you definitely want to ask your healthcare provider who you're monitoring uh, your blood sugar with and your diabetes management, you want to ask them what their goal for you is. And they'll look back at your past A1Cs, they'll look back at your other health history, and they can give you a more personalized um, you know, kind of example of what your range should be. And it should be a range because again, uh, we're coming up on the holiday season. Uh, you know, there's definitely different things that during the year, you know, you might eat more, you know, hearty carb loaded foods like in the winter time when it's colder. Um, so it's gonna be something that's seasonal and cyclical in terms of seeing different patterns in your A1C. So it's something to be you know, mindful of, to be aware of, but definitely ask your provider about your specific goal. So risk factors for type 2 diabetes, which is mostly what we focus on, because type 2 is something that can be changed and influenced through lifestyle and diet choices, whereas type 1 diabetes is not. Uh, if you do have someone who uh, has type 1 diabetes, you still can get a lot of benefit out of today, but we're going to focus more on type 2 and gestational. So obesity is a factor in this. Uh, you know, if you're over 45 years old or older, you're at more of a risk. Your family history and then your personal history of high blood pressure, high cholesterol, gestational diabetes, your level of physical activity. So if you're not physically active, that's going to play a role. If you have a history of heart disease or stroke, a history of depression, or a history of polycystic ovarian syndrome, that all could play a role. And so you want to just be mindful of what are your personal risk factors. 
So normal blood sugar levels, I've listed those here, um, you know, based on uh, what we see clinically. So again, this may not be specific to you, but this is the general guideline. So for fasting blood sugar, you would like to see that under 100. So if you haven't eaten breakfast, you haven't had anything but water or, you know, just plain black coffee, you should be at 100 or less, okay? And so the official recommendation for someone who has diabetes would be 80 to 130. So you see that you get a little bit more room because they know that your blood sugar is going to be a little bit higher. For after meals, so when we look at, you know, how many hours after a meal, we usually test two hours after a meal. A normal person um, or normal for a person without diabetes would be um, less than 140. And then official ADA recommendation with diabetes would be less than 180. And so you see you've got some wiggle room there. And then normal for a person without diabetes would be less than 5.7 for your HbA1c. And then official ADA would be seven or less. And most people now will say a normal for a person without diabetes, um, they really want to see it under five. So they want to see a four. Uh, but this is a, the official kind of uh, recommendation from the American Dietetic Association or the ADA, and they are the ones that put out the guidelines. And so you will see that some doctors will definitely um, make some changes to the recommendations. And most doctors that I've met with really want to be under five. So for prediabetes, when we think about 87, you know, million Americans, as many as 87 have prediabetes each year, and we look at the elevated blood glucose levels, um, it's just simply that they are not quite high enough or sustained for long enough to be diagnosed with diabetes. But all of the things that are there in terms of risk factors um, are, are starting to appear. And so um, long-term damage can happen with prediabetes, even though you may not be treated at the moment. Uh, it's something that you want to be mindful of and you want to be checking with your, your healthcare provider. Healthy lifestyle habits can reverse the signs and symptoms of early stages of prediabetes and diabetes. And so um, even if you can't have complete reversal, it's still really important to make healthy lifestyle habit changes. We're going to talk about those. So again, I mentioned type 1 diabetes. It's known as insulin-dependent diabetes. And sometimes people will say juvenile diabetes. But we're really moving away from that term to talk about it being an autoimmune-related diabetes because we're seeing more and more people in their early 20s, particularly young women who are more likely to have autoimmune conditions, being diagnosed with type 1. And we think about type 1 being really young children, and that's just not what we're seeing right now. And so it is more of an autoimmune condition than, than just simply a juvenile diabetes. Diabetes type 2 is usually non-insulin dependent, but when your diabetes progresses, it can become insulin dependent. Um, so just think about um, that in terms of, you know, management. If you're able to manage with, with lifestyle and with over-the-counter like oral medications and vitamins and supplements, that's going to be a better option than when you become insulin dependent. Uh, so even if you can't reverse your type 2 diabetes, you still want to try to manage things with just your oral medications so that you're not going to be a later dependent on insulin because that does really change your health and your lifestyle behaviors. Um, so that can be troublesome for, for some folks. Advanced diabetes can lead to that insulin dependence, like I mentioned, and so um, that does get a little bit harder to manage with type 2. Um, personally, my husband is uh, a type 2 diabetic and um, has been diagnosed since 2007 with diabetes, and he's recently become insulin dependent, and that has been a really hard shift, and so just know that you can do everything right. You can be a healthy weight and you can be really compliant with all of the things that your healthcare providers tell you to do and you can still have advancement in your diabetes. And so that's why I really hope my message today for y'all um, is important. I hope it's heard because I know there are times where you do everything, you know, quote unquote, right and you still don't have the outcome that you hoped for. So I hope that that it gives a little bit of comfort for you if that's part of your story and your journey. So type 1 diabetes, the person usually doesn't produce enough insulin or any insulin to be able to um, help the body function. So insulin really has this mechanism of transportation of sugar from the blood into the cells, and it helps 
your cells be able to have energy, to use energy. And so as a result of your sugar levels in the blood rising, um, you can definitely have symptoms from that because we're not wanting our blood sugar to stay a sustained, uh, you know, high. We need to get some fuel, get some sugar in us to have energy. And then we need to be able to use that energy and complete the cycle. And with diabetes, that often doesn't happen. With type two diabetes, you do produce insulin, but the cells are typically resistant to that insulin, meaning that the cells just can't use it. And so when the cells become resistant, a lot of times you just end up having a patient who does have a lot of sugar on board, but it's not getting to where it needs to go. And so the sugar levels in the blood will rise because the cells can't take them. So if you think about the cell as a Pac-Man, the Pac-Man should eat the, the sugar and have energy to fuel itself. Uh, and when it can't use it in type two diabetes, then what ends up happening is it stays in the blood system, bloodstream, and you get symptoms from that. And you usually feel really fatigued and tired. So maybe that is a, a helpful visual. I like to use Pac-Man to, to explain it because our cells really do act that way. So with gestational diabetes, it's important to think about, uh, you know, we often get, uh, you know, testing periodically, but usually we have a glucose tolerance test when we're in our, um, kind of toward the second trimester or third trimester in pregnancy, and you will drink a glucose drink that will spike your blood sugar. And then you get tested um, typically at an hour to see how much you've actually processed that glucose drink. And that lets you screen for whether you may have gestational diabetes or prediabetes. And so it's really important that we know this, not only for the development of the baby, because high blood sugars can impact your, your baby's development in terms of uh, you know, growth and development. It can cause the baby to you know, gain a lot of weight. So you can have a baby that's over nine pounds. Anytime we see a baby that's more than nine pounds, we screen the mom to make sure that there's not a, a diabetes or a, an insulin issue there. Uh, because that's a usually kind of one of those hallmark signs that there may be something going on there. Um, you can also have some, uh, you know, some birth defects and some deformities, congenital uh, deformities from the heart. So there's just lots of things that can happen with gestational diabetes. So it's important to monitor that. Um, it doesn't mean that it's inevitable. It just means that it is a risk factor. And so you also have an increased risk for cardiovascular disease and stroke if you do have high blood uh, sugar. So it's important to monitor those things. And usually high blood sugar, high cholesterol, uh, and uh, high blood sugar go hand in hand. So it's important that you're looking at all of those values as you're monitoring your overall health and wellness. So I mentioned there are some other things to be mindful of or aware of, and it's really a cluster of conditions that is considered to be metabolic syndrome. So you have a risk of heart disease, of stroke, and type 2 diabetes. Those are going to be the things that uh, if you have increased blood pressure, blood sugar, excess body fat around the waist or the around the core, because that fat is going to be or that adipose tissue is going to be around your main organs. And then if you have a high cholesterol and high triglyceride levels, then you're really at risk for this metabolic syndrome. And other risk factors include being overweight or having a diagnosis of obesity. Uh, middle age and higher is going to be a risk factor. Um, some you know, ethnicities or just genetics play a role in whether or not you are at prone to metabolic syndrome, if you already have diabetes, and then if you have other diseases like fatty liver disease, and that can be alcoholic or non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, polycystic ovarian syndrome, like I mentioned, and even sleep apnea can play a role. And so with metabolic syndrome, that's something that many Americans are diagnosed with. And uh, again, lifestyle choices, lifestyle habits are going to be really impactful for helping to either reverse or improve these different symptoms that you might experience. So you're going to see people who have insulin resistance, hypertension, high triglycerides, low HDL cholesterol, um, but high LDL cholesterol, and then the visceral obesity. That means that, uh, you know, centralized kind of core adipose tissue or fat tissue 
around your, your main organs. And that is kind of what makes up the metabolic syndrome that we see. So some things to prevent this, this is going to help you because if you do have a diagnosis of diabetes, you want to make sure that you're not developing other things uh, along with that, that you're not developing high blood pressure or high cholesterol or high triglycerides. And so getting 30 minutes of physical activity a day, uh, usually we ask you to do four to five days a week of 30 minutes or more of exercise, eating lots of fruits and vegetables, lean protein and whole grains are important. Um, we're going to talk later about full fiber carbohydrates. Those are really important for you to get in uh, your meals. And so um, it's not that you can't eat carbohydrates or carbs. It's that you just have to make different choices about the carbs that you do eat, limiting the saturated fat and salt intake in your diet. And what I'll say about salt, I have a archived webinar on heart health and anyone who has diabetes or who is concerned about diabetes, I would really encourage you to go to the archive and watch the one on cardiovascular health because um, with salt, salt has really been villainized as being, you know, unhealthy and, and kind of quote unquote bad for you, but salt is still necessary for our functioning. And so I would just encourage you to think about adding in Celtic sea salt or maybe even Himalayan pink salt. Um, it's important that you're getting enough iodine in your diet. So those are going to be salts that don't have iodine added. So if you're concerned about that, you would need to still get your regular table salt. But regular table salt is what's really more important that you avoid using that to the extreme. When you use Celtic sea salt, that is a helpful salt because it has around uh, 80 plus trace minerals in it that can really help you in terms of staying hydrated and getting the adequate um, nutrition that you need from your diet. And then maintaining a healthy weight, which I know can be challenging, um, especially it's a vicious cycle. When you have extra weight, you're going to have, you know, additional challenges with managing your blood sugar. And when you're trying to manage your blood sugar, you, you're going to have some difficulty sometimes managing your weight. That's not true for everyone, but it's really common. And so you just have to work on doing the best you can in terms of weight management. Uh, and then things like not smoking, you know, it's important when you have metabolic syndrome because you're at risk for blood clots and different um, circulation issues that you don't want to have any kind of tobacco or nicotine on board because that's going to increase your risk as well. So early symptoms of diabetes are going to be things like your increased thirst, your hunger, and your frequent urination. And we call those the three Ps, polydipsia, polyphagia, and polyuria. Uh, you also can have increased infections, things like urinary tract infections. Uh, you can have things like thrush, and that's the white patches that you get in the back of your throat. A lot of times you'll have dry mouth, unexplained weight loss, or even weight gain, just depending on the types of symptoms you're having. Uh, fatigue, blurred vision, headaches, and just really overall not feeling well. Some complications, I've mentioned a few of these, and I know probably most of you know these, but it's important that you're really taking good care of your feet and your eyes. Uh, those are two areas that we sometimes don't do enough education on, uh, particularly your eyes, because you can have an increased risk of glaucoma, so that high ocular pressure, cataracts, and of course, usually diabetic teaching will cover your foot care because so you, you can have neuropathy and you cannot realize that you have a, a sore or pressure ulcer or that you, um, you know, have an issue with loss of sensation in your feet and legs. Um, and it's more in your feet and legs because it's further away from the core of your body, your heart, and where all the blood is pumping. So you want to make sure that you do a good job of checking your feet, being really careful when you cut your toenails. Um, doing really good foot care, making sure that you don't get blisters and sores. We really recommend that you wear white socks if you can't, you know, visually see your foot well, so that you know if you see any kind of blood or um, something that would cue you that there's a problem with your feet. But having, um, you know, those regular diabetic foot checks and having your eyes checked, so actually seeing someone an ophthalmologist that can actually dilate your eyes, having a dilated eye exam is super important. So not just checking for visual acuity to see if you need glasses, but actually dilating your eyes and, and checking to make sure that your pressure and your nerves are doing well. That's really important. 
And so if you're not doing that, please make sure that you um, consider an appointment and make sure that your ophthalmologist knows that you do have an issue with your blood sugar. So over time, when we have this increased circulation in glucose, we start to see damage in the vessels. So you can have plaque buildup in your arteries, and that's where we're concerned about the high cholesterol, because when you have high cholesterol, cholesterol is actually sent out into the blood vessels to patch those areas of damage. So high cholesterol really isn't the problem as much as it's the red flag that's being waved to say, hey, there's a lot of damage that's going on in our vessels and, and we're sending out a lot of cholesterol to help patch that. Um, we think that high cholesterol, we talk about high cholesterol as if high cholesterol causes the problem, but really high cholesterol is just an indication that there is a problem. And that's a really important distinction. So the combination of diabetes and high cholesterol is actually going to increase those risk factors, like I mentioned. And some of the ones that I didn't mention are the kidney disease um, that you can see, peripheral artery disease, and then the issues with your eyes. So retinopathy, cataracts, and the glaucoma that I mentioned. And I know that this is not super uplifting. We're going to get to the uplifting part. <laughs> The neurological system too can be exposed and damaged. And so that results in neuropathy, which is what I was talking about with the feet and the legs, where you're not getting good blood flow or circulation. And so you do have some nerve damage. And typically that is not reversible, but you could see an alleviation of symptoms when you make diet and lifestyle changes. And that's what we're working toward in this presentation. Uh, you know that you may have neuropathy if you have a burning, a tingling, or a painful sensation. You may also have some numbness or just altered sensation if someone touches you or you bump something. The sensation feels different than it has before. You may have some neuropathy going on, and it's important that you follow up with your doctor about that or your healthcare provider. Your immune system also can really weaken as a result of the high blood sugar levels. And so um, you might have those foot infections I mentioned, yeast infections or thrush in your, in your throat, the UTIs, or even poor wound healing. So if you have surgeries or you have injuries, those things may not heal as well. And so that's important to consider. You may need to take some supplements. Um, zinc is really usually helpful for uh, wound healing and can help you when you've got a lot of excess sugar on board. Uh, and this is just, you know, general education, obviously talk with your healthcare provider, um, but zinc is one of those that you can add as a supplement occasionally and can help you um, as you're managing things like infections and uh, wound healing. That can be a really helpful addition to your diet. But the sweet truth about diabetes is that you can really take control over some of the things that we've talked about. And I want to encourage you because um, having, you know, personally walked the journey with my husband and his diagnosis and having taken care of a lot of patients with diabetes, I see people get really um, a little bit defeated sometimes in their diagnosis and feeling like, well, I have diabetes, I'm taking this medicine. Uh, there's really no point in doing X, Y, or Z. And so I'd like to encourage you to take control of what you can control. And, you know, you never know how much improvement you might see when you start to make some changes. And, you know, consistency is key here. Uh, it's not about being perfect a few days a week. It's about being imperfect consistently every day. And so let's talk about how we can start to make some changes. So, you know, prevention of further progression or prevention for those of you who may just be on the call interested in diabetes really starts with just awareness like you're doing here, nourishing your body, being more active, managing your sleep and your rest. So rest is important. We think about only resting when we're at sleep at night, but you really should be resting about three times a day for five to 15 minutes. So take a five to 15 minute break in the morning, afternoon, and evening. If you're on medications to manage things like high blood pressure or um, you know, some of the other things we've mentioned, take your medications as directed. Really take care of yourself, take care of your body. Try to avoid the things like tobacco, um, you know, excess alcohol, nicotine, vapes, all of those things are gonna make it harder for your body to heal. 
tobacco and nicotine especially delay wound healing and have a lot of impact on, on the body in that sense. It's a big burden. It's a stressor for the body. Uh, keep your routine medical appointments because, again, screening is so important to being able to do good prevention and progression work. Monitor your blood sugar and your blood pressure and your cholesterol. We talk a lot in the cardiovascular health about um, blood pressure and high cholesterol in that relationship. So I'm not going to go into it a lot here, but when you have high blood pressure, we say that that's the silent killer. And I really think that that's a misnomer because you do have symptoms with high blood pressure at, at the later stages. So you get headaches and fatigue and you get a tightness, you start to get fluid on board. The high cholesterol, you really don't get signs and symptoms of that. And so high cholesterol, I think, is more of the silent killer. And high cholesterol usually predates high blood pressure. So the common scenario is that you go into your provider's office and you get blood work done and you get your vital signs taken. And they say, oh, you have high blood pressure, let's look at your labs. And then they'll say, oh, well, you happen to have high cholesterol too. Well, really you probably had high cholesterol. There's some instances where this isn't true, but you usually have high cholesterol first and then you notice the high blood pressure because you're getting damage through inflammation to your vessels. The body sends out that high cholesterol deposits to be able to go and patch and repair the vessel. And then when it can't do that, you know, properly, you start adding more cholesterol deposits. That makes, if you're thinking about, you know, a hose, if you're thinking about a water hose as a vessel, those little deposits in the vessel build up with cholesterol because you're trying to patch the same areas. And then your blood pressure has to increase to get through that vessel or to get through that hose. And so it's inflammation starts that. And then cholesterol is sent out to fix it. And then the third thing is that you have the high blood pressure because the cholesterol deposits make that vessel shorter, narrower, so you can't actually get the blood through. So that's kind of a, a really quick, oversimplified version of how those things work together. But I hope it makes sense because in my experience, we don't talk about those relationships enough. And if we know better, we can do better. So managing your stress, and I know that's like telling you to manage your weight. It's easier said than done, but really try to think about ways that you can alleviate some stress in your life. So healthy changes could be a number of things, and we're going to talk about some of my favorites. So when we think about focusing on our health and wellness, we really want to focus on our health and wellness, not just our diabetes diagnosis. We're more than a diagnosis. Um, and you hear us say diabetic uh, education or diabetic patients, but you are not just your diabetes uh, diagnosis. So please know that. Managing your blood sugar is important, but that's not all that you have to do. You really want to think about your cardiovascular health and adding in some cardio workouts every week. And that doesn't mean high intensity interval training. It just means maybe vigorously walking with your healthcare provider's approval, knowing the common signs of heart disease and stroke so that you're aware if you start to have those kinds of symptoms. And then realizing how much truly your mindset and your stress play a role in your overall health. Exercising and daily movement is important, not just dieting, but just making healthier food choices. And that looks like looking at a food label. So avoiding trans fats and added sugars. So that doesn't mean to avoid, you know, fruit. Some people will tell you if you're diabetic, don't eat fruit. That I don't think is helpful. I think most people need to eat fruit. There's lots of good benefits to those, um, you know, minerals that you're not going to get and those vitamins that you're not going to get from other sources. And it's always better to eat our vitamins and nutrients than it is to supplement. We sometimes do need to supplement, but if we can eat it in a fresh form, that's going to be better for you. So try to avoid trans fats and added sugars. Look at your food labels. Trans fats, you want to be zero. Trans fats sound like they're fats, but they're actually human made chemicals. So if you see trans fats on the packaging, it means that it's really been processed and it has additional chemicals or preservatives on board. Um, so you really wanna think about when you're shopping in the grocery store to shop the perimeter 
of the grocery store, the inner aisles are going to be the places where you get the processed food. But if you notice your, your dairy, your uh, fruits and vegetables, um, those sorts of things, your frozen fruits and vegetables, those are on the outer periphery or the, the perimeter of the store. Um, the not so healthy choices are going to be in those center aisles. And so think about that. Use your blood sugar monitor every day. If you don't have one, definitely think about getting one. You can get a prescription for one from your doctor. Tracking your blood sugar numbers is so important to know your numbers so that you can make changes. Keeping your regular checkups. Usually people who have a diagnosis of diabetes go at least every three or six months to see their physician, not just uh, once a year or their, their nurse practitioner. Seek out mental health care if you need it. Having a chronic condition really is uh, a challenge. I don't have diabetes, but I do have a chronic health condition. Uh, I have a heart condition and an autoimmune condition. And I personally can tell you that, you know, struggling with um, just everyday challenges in addition to having a chronic condition, especially if it's an invisible condition, can be really challenging for your mental well-being and your mental health. So maybe seek out a counselor or um, someone that can be a source of support for you. Customize your wellness plan to fit your goals. So everyone's not going to have the same goals, and that's great. We don't want you to. We want you to have, really have a personalized plan. And then try to join a group or a community or some sort of extra support to have that added accountability and um, that added emotional support that you need when you're making lifestyle changes. And that could just be meeting a friend to go walk on your lunch break, or um, that could be someone that also has diabetes that you, you know, text and say, hey, I found this great, um, you know, new snack bar that doesn't have a lot of carbs in it. You know, you might want to try it too. It can be really, really simple. And the wellness basics is where I tell everyone to start, regardless of whether you have diabetes or not, uh, if you're just wanting to lose weight, if you're wanting to just get healthier, I tell everyone to start here. And that's why I have the GPS start here pin, because regardless of why you're on the call or what topic we're talking about, these are the things that you need to take uh, care of yourself with, you know, establishing a good foundation and baseline, sleeping well. So not just numbers of hours, not just quantity, but quality. You know, you know, you need a cool, dark, quiet room. You need uninterrupted sleep. You need to kind of have a power down hour so that you're getting in bed uh, by 10 o'clock and you're not having a lot of blue light exposure from your screens. Uh, you need to stay hydrated, drinking about half of your body weight in ounces a day, but usually not more than 100 to 128 ounces. Um, so usually a gallon of water or less a day. Most of us do not drink enough. And when you're chronically dehydrated, which most of us are, that's definitely going to make your high blood sugars have even more of an exaggerated effect on your body because then you have high blood sugar and you don't have the water you need to transport and move the sugar where it needs to go. You really need to nourish your body. You know, we often think about just eating green foods as healthy foods, but um, usually we're eating beige and brown food. We need to eat the rainbow in terms of, you know, reds and oranges and purples and, um, and green, you know, all of the things that we know have, you know, extra nutrients and minerals and antioxidants. If you're missing a color on your plate, you're missing a key, uh, you know, antioxidant or mineral or vitamin. So I uh, definitely focus on eating whole foods, eating plant-based foods. So we like to say, you know, veggies um, most and when you're making choices about your food and water first. Uh, move your body every day. That doesn't mean you have to do a dedicated exercise program, but it could be a dance party in your kitchen. It could be a walk around the block or a walk around the quad on your lunch break. Uh, just something to move your body every day. And then meditation or your kind of what I call brain breaks. Those five to 15 minute breaks a day, you could do some meditation. Um, if you're a person of faith, it could be a prayer. It could be music. It could be a meditation app. It could be just sitting in silence for a few minutes with your eyes closed, but just taking a few minutes to give your brain a break. I always tell people that meditation is for the mind, what sleep is for the body. And so we're not designed to, you know, turn the alarm clock off in the morning and go, go, go until bedtime, but that's often what we do. And that's contributing to our, 
our psychological and our physiological stressors. So for nutrition, we're going to talk more details about nutrition. You really want to try to think of your plate and divide it into three sections where you're getting your macros, your protein, your carbs, and your healthy fats. So you want to have the largest section of your plate be non-starchy vegetables. You want to have some grains and some starchy foods. You want to aim for things like full fiber carbs. Um, so for a breakfast, that might be oatmeal. In the other section, you want to have a lean protein. So think chicken or fish. And you also want to have a serving of fruit or dairy or, you know, something that will complement what you're eating. Then also a choice of healthy fats. So that could be avocado or that could be butter. Um, there's lots of good examples of that. Those are two of my favorite sources of healthy fats. And then you want to make sure that you, with your meal, have something that's low calorie or no calorie to drink. So water is the preference, but maybe unsweetened tea or coffee. And a lot of times people will ask me about waters. Can we have carbohydrates, um, added sugars in waters with things like uh, carbonated drinks, and those are better than soft drinks, so I say yes. Uh, just find one that doesn't have a lot of extra chemicals or added sugars in there. And then the goal really is to have a lean protein, a full fiber carbohydrate, and a healthy fat at every meal, and that's going to be a healthy meal that helps sustain your blood sugar. So um, again, this is kind of the eat the rainbow concept. And tracking your meals with a food journal or an app like MyFitnessPal would be really helpful because in MyFitnessPal, even in the free edition, it will actually tell you how much you have in terms of carbs, protein, and fat, and it tracks your calories. Uh, but I would say calories are important to know. Most of us actually under eat. So it's important that you're maintaining a good calorie, um, you know, maintenance, because especially for women or people who are, you know, told that they need to lose weight, they actually under eat. And that can actually make you gain weight, uh, which, you know, we don't talk about enough, but it can. And so you want to make sure that you're getting plenty of calories and that you're making sure that you're counting your chemicals, those extra preservatives and trans fats as much as you're counting your calories. And then I just want to encourage you to make one change at a time because this is a lot of information. Uh, it can be overwhelming, but when you just take one baby step at a time, you really can make consistent changes. And consistency, like I said, is going to be your friends, much better than perfection. For protein, these are some examples of protein um, that you would want to be about a third to a fourth of your plate. So beans and hummus and lentils and peas, soy nuts. Uh, fish, poultry, beef, cheese, and eggs. These are all going to be really good sources of protein. And that's important, especially if you're not a meat eater. Uh, if you're vegan or vegetarian or pescatarian, you want to just make sure that you're getting really good sources of protein and that you're getting complete proteins. Because if you're not eating meat, then you're probably going to have to eat a couple of different things every meal to be able to have a complete protein. So that definitely is more in the realm of a registered dietitian's uh, scope of practice, but I'm gonna give you some information on one of our wonderful uh, registered dietitian nutritionists here on campus. That's a great resource for y'all. So grains and starchy vegetables, these are some examples of things that you uh, want to think about. And you might want to make note of, you know, where can I include these things or where do I need to limit these things in my diet? And that's going to be about a third to a fourth of your plate. And then you've got your non-starchy vegetables, and this is going to be about half of your plate. So um, the things that we consider to be healthy uh, or good for you are going to be things that are going to have that low glycemic index and are not going to be starchy. So asparagus, beans, Brussels sprouts, broccoli, and, you know, you can cook these. These don't have to be raw. So, um, you know, you can definitely add some butter to these, add some seasoning that doesn't have a lot of extra salt in there, and you can make these taste really, really good and get in some of your extra fat and flavor that you need. So these don't have to be raw. And then healthy fat examples are going to be things like avocados, cheese, dark chocolate, whole eggs, fatty fish, nuts, chia seeds, which are really good in smoothies, 
um, extra virgin olive oil, coconut, then coconut oil, and full fat yogurt. So full fat Greek yogurt is my favorite. And um, there's definitely some non-dairy options for people who are concerned about dairy. So those are healthy fat options. Diet and exercise, about a 10% reduction in your body weight. So just losing 10% of your body weight will make a significant difference in your diabetes. And so if you do start to lose weight, make sure that you check in with your provider who's managing your diabetes and your medication, because even losing 5, 10, 15, 20 pounds will make a huge difference if you're using a CPAP to sleep. You need to call your, your neurologist. If you're uh, you know, on medications or insulin, you certainly need to call them as soon as you start to lose weight because they're going to need to monitor you and potentially change your, your dosing. Because uh, if you're still taking the same medication dose for that higher weight, you could bottom out your blood sugar and that could be really serious. So make sure that you're um, paying close attention to that. So weight loss is good, but you've got to monitor it. And there are different goals and things that you can set here. I included this as uh, one of the common things that we see in terms of setting goals for exercise. So making sure that you're decreasing your blood pressure. So systolic and diastolic blood pressure that reduces your risk of cardiovascular disease and ultimately, you know, weight loss. If weight loss is a challenge for you, if that's a part of your diabetes diagnosis. So doing things like endurance training, moderate intensity activities like walking, so sustained uh, increase in your heart rate for 45 minutes, four to five times a week is kind of the gold standard for intensity. And again, 30 minutes to 45 minutes is kind of the goal. Start at 30 if that's uh, comfortable for you. And then five to seven days a week with five really being what we're aiming for when you start to make these changes. And then it's hopefully going to just overall increase your ability to participate in your regular activities of daily living with a lot of energy and stamina. That's the goal, to have good quality of life. There are lots of different medication therapies that you can do, and I'm just mentioning those here because there are so many different choices today to manage your, your diabetes. And so ask your doctor if you're having symptoms. A lot of times people just start out with metformin or glucophage, but there are other choices. So if you're having um, side effects or symptoms, there are extended release uh, dosing that you can do because a lot of times you'll have um, GI upset or diarrhea or nausea on metformin. So just know that there are other options that you can ask your doctor or provider about. Stress management is so important. I've mentioned it several times, but sometimes telling people to manage their stress is a lot like telling people to just have a positive attitude. Uh, it feels a little bit intangible. How do you manage your stress? I think it's important to check in with yourself every day, maybe journal something out. Um, if journaling is something you don't want to do, maybe just jot down some notes in your notes app on your phone and just, you know, think about what's causing my stress, what's triggering my stress. I have a couple of talks on stress that you can reference in the archived webinars that go through more specific, tangible things that you can do. The movement and meditation is really going to be a huge part of that because, again, when you move, it really helping your body get rid of those stress hormones. And so that's going to be something that it completes the stress cycle because your body's stress response is designed to help you run away from a danger. So our body thinks every stressor in our life is a saber tooth tiger and the saber tooth tiger in, you know, prehistoric days when our stress response was needed for that, it was to flee or it was to fight. And so sitting at your desk stressed over an email, you really need to get up, change the scenery, take a brief walk around your building and come back because that's going to help you get rid of those um, stress hormones that you'll, you'll see rise, like your adrenaline, your cortisol. Within about 20 minutes, you will have, after you've had a, a reaction or a stress response, it takes about 20 minutes for that to come back down. So unplug, disconnect, rest as often as you need to, and then seek that support, whether, you know, it's friends and family, or maybe it's accountability partner, or maybe it is a mental health um, provider, maybe it's life coaching or health coaching through our office, any of these things can really help. Monitoring your blood sugar, again, is so important. 
And especially when you're having an acute illness or sickness, uh, you're going to see if you've got the common cold or you've got the flu or sinus infection, expect that your blood sugar is going to be elevated because it's part of the stress response. But you're going to want to monitor your blood sugar more frequently during those times of stress or illness. And then track the symptoms that you're having because you could have high blood sugar and not have any symptoms. And most of the time you're going to have a lot of symptoms when it's over 300 or it's less than probably 80 or 70 if you're used to having high blood sugar. The bottom normal is 60, but um, I know at least for, for my patients that I see for my husband, when his gets even in the normal range of 70 to 80, he'll have some symptoms. And so that's something to really take note of. Um, we get more concerned about lower blood sugars, um, you know, because that can be an immediate a medical emergency. Of course, it can be when it gets too high, too. Um, but you just want to make sure that you're staying really consistent. You may want to take some glucose tabs with you um, because as your diabetes progresses, it can get really high and then it can go really low um, in a pretty quick, you know, span of time. And so having glucose tabs, you can get those at the local pharmacy. That might be something you want to keep in your pocket. A medical alert bracelet could be really helpful. Um, you know, that's something that you might want to consider getting. I ordered one for my husband online on Amazon that has all of his health information and our contact information. Because again, with high blood sugars, you could get lose consciousness or have cognitive impairment. So it might be a good idea to have that if that's something that you're concerned about. Again, frequency of blood sugar is going to depend on a lot of factors, um, but you need to be monitoring them at least around your meal times. And so I'll, I'll leave this to the discretion of you and your provider, but at least three times a day. If you're newly diagnosed, six times a day is really the benchmark. And then this is a book called Master Your Diabetes. It does have a more integrative and complementary alternative medicine approach. So um, this is not you know, allopathic or conventional medicine. This is really something that's gonna be more holistic, but I think it's a good read and it gives you some good information. It's just for educational purposes, but it's a place to start doing a deeper dive if you do have questions. We also have a program called Livongo, and it's a diabetes management program that's free to you as a benefit of you know, your employment if you have the uh, insurance plan with the university. And so it is a voluntary health coaching program that enables you to have a, a health coach, a certified diabetes educator will be your coach and will help you walk through your blood sugar readings and your other health data. And this program launched in 2020, and they have given a lot of great resources, a welcome kit, lots of good information and support. And so this is a good way for you to get your glucose meter, a scale, a blood pressure cuff, and supplies to check your A1C. And so there are a couple of ways that you can enroll. And I would encourage you, although we can send this out to you for the presentation, I would just take a quick screenshot if you would like more information about this. And you can go to the website under human resources to sign up. All right. So I know that we're ending kind of our time together, but we're gonna go over your questions and some of the things that I haven't gotten to yet. This is us on social media. So please give us a follow. Ashley and Miranda do a wonderful job of maintaining our communications here. So please do check those out. Have tons of information here on the website at wellness.ua.edu. So definitely go there for some of those archived webinars and resources. We also have a blog and then Facebook and Instagram. So I'm going to leave this here. It talks about health and life coaching and other resources that you might be interested in. And I'm going to move to the chat. We will probably go a little over time, but if you need to leave at um, one o'clock, feel free, but I will stay to make sure I answer your questions. All right. So uh, we're gonna talk about the keto diet in just a moment. I see questions about that. Any suggestions for someone who has to be on medications with steroids for months at a time? Definitely talk to your provider, but steroids are going to increase your blood sugar. So make sure that you're monitoring your blood sugar every day. And you may want to be a little more um, cognizant of the calories and the carbs that you eat while you're on steroids. So that may be something that you definitely want to talk to your provider about. Yes, Bobby, we can get a copy of this to you. Miranda mentioned she can email the slides after the class. 
So glad so many of you want these. I know I had to move through them quickly to get all this information out to you. Glad y'all are excited about it. Marina, thanks for putting the link in to the Livongo page. That's great. Y'all go grab that link if y'all want it. Um, okay, Patricia, you said that they haven't sent the scalar blood pressure cup. So reach out to your coach and uh, ask them about that because that should be a part of your benefit. Gina, thanks for the compliment. Okay. Oh, Patricia. Great. Marina is going to help take care of you. Are eggs okay to eat daily? I think eggs are a great source of protein. And I think it's helpful for you if they make you feel good. So um, I am not someone who can eat eggs every day. I, if I eat eggs every day, I have symptoms and I just don't tolerate them well. But if you can eat them and you don't have any problems or concerns, you should be fine. Um, there's a lot of kind of myth about eating eggs causes high cholesterol, uh, but we get cholesterol in a couple of different ways. We get cholesterol because our body makes it and we get cholesterol because we eat it. So if cholesterol is an issue or you have symptoms, then you probably don't wanna eat eggs every day. Um, and you probably wanna vary it a little bit anyway, because you're gonna need some different, um, you know, different vitamins and nutrient sources. But if it works for you, it should be fine. And yes, I did say zinc. I wouldn't take it daily, uh, Bobby, but I would take it strategically when I knew that I needed extra support. Like if I had a wound or an incision or I was having symptoms that I was low in zinc, uh, I would consider taking it with my healthcare provider's knowledge and, and kind of approval. Uh, it shouldn't cause a lot of issues for you, but anytime you supplement, you want to make sure that there's no interactions with medications or, or other things personal to you. Uh, but no, most supplements don't need to be taken every day. Most supplements need to be taken, you know, periodically to just help supplement until you can get your body back to where it needs to be and consuming that in your food. Um, Good, Marsha, I'm glad that you're considering enrollment. Thanks for that feedback. So I wanna talk about keto just for a second. I think keto can be helpful for some people for short periods of time. I do not think anyone um, what, you know, needs to be on keto long-term. Our bodies aren't designed for that. You can have a lot of kidney damage from doing that. And so I, I, I do not think that keto is something that um, is healthy or helpful for most people. Um, so I think there's definitely going to be a lot of uh, benefits in terms of weight loss, but weight loss does not mean health. So uh, weight loss is not, you know, uh, equaling health in, in my opinion. So I would not say that keto is the best thing to do. I would say increasing your protein, increasing your vegetables, your eating your good fats, which a lot of us avoid, um, and making sure that we're doing those other wellness basics are going to get you to the same point, but it's going to take longer, but it will be more sustainable without the, the health risk of a keto diet, because that's hard on your heart and your kidneys. Um, so I would personally never recommend it for anyone, but you do see results with weight loss. And so that is very tempting for people. Um, carb count. Most people want to see that you keep your carbs between 35 and 40 um, or lower. So when you're looking at the grams of carbohydrates, that's what most people are going to say, but that can vary depending on your circumstances. So um, you just want to make sure you can find some good uh, calculators and I will make a note to add that to future presentations and I will send that to Miranda. There's some macro calculators that you can actually use to determine what would be a good macro count for you. And it will look at your carbs. Um, but there's also some great diabetes teaching that, you know, they're going to tell you to keep it under 30 to 40. Uh, I have been taking cinnamon capsules to help regulate my blood sugar. Yeah, cinnamon and uh, turmeric or uh Curcumin, those are really good ones for, um, for regulating your blood sugar. Zinc can also help sometimes. Again, not every day, but those are also some good ones. Uh, per day, Janice, that's uh, 35 to 40 per day, not per meal. Good clarification. And then cravings, I think really we're under eating if we're having a lot of cravings, unless we're just not getting all of the vitamins and nutrients and minerals that we need. 
So cravings really come either from an emotional place or they come because we're not getting the foods that we need. So we're craving, like for, if we're depriving ourselves of carbs, then you're going to crave pizza if you love pizza. Um, on low carb days, when I do that, I do carb cycling. All I want is pizza because that is carbs and it's delicious. And so it, we're probably depriving ourselves uh, of something that we, our body needs like energy or we're emotionally eating. You know, we've had a stressful day and we want a donut or we want a method. So I think cravings are all about being in check with your emotions and then making sure that you're eating a balanced meal and that you're not depriving yourselves of calories and that will help your cravings. Uh, good food choices are the things that our grandparents and great grandparents ate. If it was grown in a garden, um, you know, if it was, you know, an animal, you know, people will say if it had a mother, um, those are things to eat. If it's made in a manufacturing plant, stay away from it. Uh, that's kind of what people will say in terms of good food choices. Snack choices, I think, are going to be things like boiled eggs, um, the, the chomps, uh, you know, beef sticks, if you are a meat eater, nuts and seeds, uh, yogurts, uh, you know, grapes or like little mini um, kind of charcuterie snacks that you can get. Uh, Target has some great ones. Aldi has some great ones where they're, they're little snack packs and they're the healthy versions of a Lunchable. Those are great snack choices. Uh, let's see what else. I think that was all that I had in my notes to cover. Any other questions, comments, or feedback? I know we're a little bit over our time, so you're welcome to go. You will get all of your credit, but want to make sure that we answer all of your questions. Yeah, thank you, Allie. Thanks for being here. All right, I'll wait just another minute or so. Good, Perdisha, I'm glad this was helpful. Great. Well, y'all, I will send the macro calculator and the information for Suzanne Henson. She is our registered dietitian nutritionist for faculty and staff over at UMC. And uh, she is a great supporter of all things Wellbama. She has been, you know, such a great resource for me personally and professionally. And if you're struggling to, uh, you know, meet some of your goals in terms of nutrition, she would be a great resource for you. She is um, covered as part of our benefit as uh, university employees. So you will have a small copay. It's usually around $20 for a visit. And she does in-person and Zoom meetings and consultations. So she'd be a great resource if you're wanting to dive more into specifics in terms of your own um, nutrition plan. But hopefully this gave you all some ideas to get started. And please feel free to reach out if you need anything at all. I will get this PowerPoint to Miranda and she'll get it out to you. So y'all, thanks so much. I hope y'all have a great rest of your day. And remember, just take one baby step at a time as you're starting to make changes. Bye, guys.